Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the IIEA. Uh, extremely topical subject today, uh, rising to the competition challenge, a new era for competition policy. Uh, competition policy, I think it's fair to say, is, is in great flux in terms of what, how competition policy, policy should be used, how subsidies should be used. A um, lot of change has gone on, probably more change in the past five years than the previous 30 years. Uh, to discuss this, our keynote speaker is the head of the European uh, Union's competition antitrust entity, one of the most powerful in the world, uh, as, as powerful, I would say, as the, the US antitrust uh, agency. Uh, Olivier Gorson is the head of that agency, and he's going to speak to us for about 20 minutes. Unfortunately, he has to leave. He's got a whole round of meetings with uh, various people, so he'll be leaving at uh, 1.30. So if you have a question, burning question for him, you'd need to indicate that nice and early um, if we have time to do that. Uh, also joining us today is Brian McHugh, chairperson of the Competition Consumer uh, Protection Commission here in Ireland. Uh, professor Amel Lamar is a Sutherland professor, professor of European Law at University College Dublin. And Loretta Sullivan is the Chief Economist and Partner at EY. So a great panel of uh, speakers. The floor is yours, Olivier. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And. Um... Well, it's, it's quite a good time to discuss about priorities in um, in competition policy. I mean, change of uh, change of commission, Draghi report, mission letters, political guidelines, all of this. Um, but to to understand where we we want to go to, it's maybe a short uh, first point on where we're coming from. I mean, the the, the ten past years, the uh, tenure of Mrs. Vestager as a competition commissioner have been transformative. Uh, in many respects. Uh, of course, the, what people remember is the enforcement in uh, tech. And, uh, and that's important, not just for the sake of it. It's important in itself, but it's all, also important because tech is pervasive. It impacts everything we do. Um, it's a, an agent for change. It brings uh, productivity up. Actually, it's interesting that, you know, Mr. Draghi talks about this, this gap between between the EU and the US. Well, if you remove the large tech companies, this gap doesn't exist. Um, and that means, well, that suggests at least that our problem is not so much to favor uh, the, the, the scaling up of uh, traditional European champions that are already very big companies in general, but rather to manage to get this type of company to emerge in Europe and scale up. Uh, and, uh, and for that, we, we, we clearly are lagging behind. So tech, very important for many, for many reasons, uh, but it's very difficult as well. Why? Because the, uh, the, the modern economy in the, tech, in the tech sector is dominated by very, very powerful network effects. And that means that if you enjoy market power, what we, what we call a gatekeeper function, so if you are dominating a market that controls access to a number of others. Say you're Microsoft, you get Windows, you cannot get access to the PC, if you, you cannot plug into Windows, you have a controlling fun function. Say you are Google, the, your search engine is uh, hyper-dominating, 90% market share. You cannot get into a number of things if you cannot plug into Google search, etc. Uh, and so when you are in that situation, in the platform economy, uh, the uh, impact of anti-competitive practices um, is, goes up at, at, at light speed. I'll give you an example. Uh, for the first Microsoft case, it basically took six months to Microsoft to kill the other browsers, which was Netscape back in the days. And it took five years to us to make the finding that it was anti-competitive and sanction it. Netscape was long dead, and nobody revived him. So for that reason, we invented some things called the Digital Market Act, which is to say, well, it's prohibited outright. And basically, instead of us having the burden of proof, you have the burden to prove that it's, that it's right. Um, and that is also a huge innovation that we will now need to bring to cruise speed. That is for, for antitrust. The other interesting development in antitrust, and you will see more of this, is that we have started to not only go stronger on enforcement, 
but also start to think how we can facilitate cooperation that might have some anti-competitive uh, aspects, but are overall beneficial. For example, in terms of innovation or otherwise. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be the first uh, Director General for Competition since 2003 who signed comfort letters to, company, to companies in that respect. And we have announced now five years ago that uh, in particular in the field of decarbonization, if companies need to team up in order to uh, make an impact or bring a new product or service uh, on the market that contributes to decarbonization, uh, they're very welcome to come and speak to us. We will see with them how we can help them and if need be, give them antitrust immunity. Mergers. It's very interesting. I, I recommend the reading. We have issued a report, this purely factual, back in June, that is called Protecting Competition. The finding roughly is that over the last 25 years, concentration rate ratios have raised considerably in the world, across the board. They have raised more than average in the US. They have raised less, less than average in the EU, but still considerably. What are these increased concentration associated with in markets that at the same time have broadened? So that means you are talking about mega corporations. Um, it is associated with higher markups in terms of growth and uh, net margin, net profit, higher dividends, higher market caps. Interestingly, no correlation with higher investments. And certainly diminished intensity of competition. You see as well that the, the net beneficiaries in each cluster of this are invariably the top two to three firms in the cluster. So higher concentration unsurprisingly benefits the biggest firms and is to the detriment of all the rest of the ecosystem. And that's the reason why in Europe we pride ourselves from uh, having had a more uh, a stronger than average enforcement, even if uh, our uh, enforcement rate is low. We intervene in 5% of the cases. That's very steady over the last 35 years. And we prohibit in 0.5% of the cases, which put in context the old questions about merger control preventing European champions from emerging, because we are talking about 29 cases over the last 35 years. If you take out of these 29 cases, the cases in which the acquirer was not a EU firm, so there is no issue about European champion, then you're, less, you're down to less than 10 cases. And if you look at each of these 10 cases, you will see that there is no way you talk about preventing European champions from emerging. Best example is the one that is always quoting in the other direction, Siemens Alstom. We are now six years after we prohibited Siemens from acquiring as Alstom, guess who are the two corporates dominating the world in the market for train running stocks? Well, Alstom and Siemens. They're number one and two worldwide. So we don't have one, we have two European champions and we have competition in Europe. Now moving to state aids. In state aids, the, the, the work has been to basically try to focus and of course these efforts have been frustrated by covid first um, and then the energy crisis second so it's a but the the general direction of travel which i very much hope we will be back on as uh, from now on is to try to focus state subsidies where it matters where it makes a difference so not to crowd out uh, private investment and uh, also because, because public resources are scarce, frankly. Um, what does that mean? We have been trying to mainstream, so to focus the, 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 the policy where it accompanies our overarching objectives, which is to be in 2050 decarbonized, resilient, and competitive. And decarbonized, resilient, and competitive are, are three aspects of one and the same thing, because if you think about it, I don't think it is possible to imagine that we could be competitive in 2050 if we're not resilient and decarbonized. 
So that's, that's a mandatory path. So we have dedicated a lot of efforts to make it easier to finance green investment and make it basically more difficult to finance with public subsidies brown investments. What does that mean for the future? Well, we need to, 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 to bridge that gap in competitiveness. And uh, I think what the Draghi report is really interesting is in the diagnosis. And the diagnosis of Draghi is we have a huge problem in disruptive innovation. Because disruptive innovation is what will fuel the productivity and the competitiveness of tomorrow. A simple analogy, at the end of the 19th century, it is clear that the future was to the countries that have developed the combustion engine, not to those that were still perfecting the uh, steam machine. And in Europe, we're pretty much perfecting the steam machine at the moment, while in the US, they're inventing the combustion engines of tomorrow. That also explains why the 100% the of the differential between them and us is these five, six, or seven tech companies. All this is very consistent. So the focus going forward of the stated policy is going to be on innovation, and in particular, on innovation in clean technologies. Uh, we need to build a clean tech in Europe. That's not only a competition policy issue. There's needs a number of other policy measures to be taken, and probably some trade measures as well. I mean. As we speak, China has a production capacity in windmills that is able to supply twice the world demand. And the need to sell this stuff and the need to dump it somewhere, they face 100% uh, uh, tariffs in, in the US. It's, it's not terribly complicated to see where they will be willing to try to, to put it. It's basically the same for EVs. So uh, we need to think very carefully of policy going forward. Competition policy will be part of the, of the toolkit, but competition policy is not, in my view, center stage in that debate. There's a number of other things that need to, be, to, to, to happen, and competition policy should be there to try to accompany uh, these, uh, these, policy, these policy measures. So I think I'm even less than my 20 minutes. And uh, I'm, I would be happy to stop there. Um, right, good. More time for uh, for questions. Uh, Brian, do you want to uh, go first? Maybe thoughts, and reflections on what Olivier has said? Yeah. Um, I mean, so the debate on competitiveness in Europe is a very real one, a very important one. Um, and I suppose one of the questions um, here to discuss today is what is the role of competition policy in terms of addressing those challenges? And... Um, uh, Olivia re uh, referenced the Protecting Competition Report, which has a lot of really good evidence in it. Um, the Siemens Alstom case as well, we've seen since that decision was made how it's played out, and we haven't seen any evidence at all, in fact, quite the opposite, that that decision was in any way wrong. Um, so what interests me is that that evidence hasn't killed the debate. Um, there is still a lot of talk, a lot of noise, that the solution to European competitiveness is to change competition policy. Um, so my, I suppose my question for Olivier has been has a huge amount of experience and he's seen the pendulum swinging in relation to competition policy. Should it be more enforcement? Should it be tougher or a little bit less? Does this feel different uh, from the, that normal pendulum we've seen over many years? Is there a risk now that competition and its central role in, the, in Europe, in the European project, might be at risk to become less central and seen as less important? Or is this just the usual pendulum that mm -hmm. you've seen over the years? Well, both, I would say. Um, I mean, when I joined the EU a very long time ago in the beginning of the 90s, the big debate at the moment was industrial policy and competition policy. And then for almost 20 years, this debate disappeared. Um, because the paradigm was uh, very neoliberal, let's be open and happily let compete, and, and now it swings back the other way around. So there is an element of that. What is worrying, and I agree with you, Brian, is that you see that in this field as well, and in Europe as well, we're moving into the world of alternative realities. Facts do not seem to matter. 
So you, you, you put the, and the facts are compelling, really. And you still are faced with the same narrative. And they don't even bother trying to discuss the facts. They, and the narrative seems to be more powerful than the facts. That I think is, and, and, and we're not talking about narrative that targets ordinary people. You could say, well, they're not terribly well educated, don't really understand. No, you're talking about the nar a narrative that goes straight at the head of our states. Let me give an example, telecoms. So the narrative of the telecom companies is, oh, look at this wonderful US market. You have three big uh, operators targeting 400 something million clients. And this is what, that they have scale, they matter worldwide, this is what we want to emulate. So now you say, okay, well, indeed, let's have a look at this US market. Surely connectivity is way better than in Europe. No, it's, it's, it's worse. And by quite a distance, it's, it's as good in cities, and not all cities, the biggest ones, and in all the rest of the country, it's really dreadful. Okay, but surely then the prices are better. No, it's much more expensive. So why did Ryan raise this issue in his report? I was perplexed by that. I'm, so am I. I like a lot of things in the, in the Draghi report, but this bit, I, I still struggle. And... Uh, so, and then you go to, okay, well, investment. And then, then the telecom operators say, yeah, well, investment is bigger in, in the US. And that is true for the last two years. Mm. Because it was so bad that they really have to catch up now. So in what respect is exactly the US model better? Well, I can tell you. The market caps are way better. The dividends are incredibly better and the bonuses as well. But I'm a competition authority. It's not exactly the interest I'm here to protect. So, but okay, let's accept for a second this model is better. And let's look what they really do. Well, now, if tomorrow, say, Dutch or Telecom wanted to emulate that model and buy Orange in France and say Telefonica in Italy, they could. I can promise here today, publicly, we would not prohibit it because they do not compete with each other. So you could tomorrow bring a EU giant on the world scene, but they don't do it. The reason that they don't do it is not competition policy. The reason they don't do it is there is no synergies. And there is no synergies because there is no internal market. The, that same internal market that the ministers just said they don't want in the council this week because they rejected the Draghi's Draghi plea. Draghi's plea is make the internal market. Let us is the same. And then you can, you can concentrate. And that is true. The day you have an internal market, so the day that from Brussels, I can take my subscription in Madrid and that doesn't make any difference, I'm fine if they merge. But that's not the world we're in. So. What the telcos say, yeah, but we one day we will be there. So we need terribly to invest. So you need to do as if this new market realities had happened. So alternative realities again. And not only I don't believe that would be correct, but actually the legal text prevent me from doing this, in my view, rightly. We, we, we have a few fact-free narratives in this country, mm -hmm. I can assure you. Uh, mm -hmm. Imelda, would you like to um, share thoughts? Competition in force is necessarily about looking back. And I think what was interesting in part about the DMA is that it was a regulatory yeah. response, but one that made room for competition. And is that a model that you see could be ruled out again in the future in relation to other sectors? That's one question. And then any comments on killer mergers and what the future may hold? Um, I'm not sure it can, be, it can be extended to other sectors because it's very, very intrusive. And the reason why it is intrusive is because in this sector in particular, you have these gatekeepers. So these guys that, because they dominate heavily one or several markets, control access to a number of other markets. And then they can decide who's the winner, who's the, whether they want to colonize it for themselves or not. This is not a feature you find in many sectors. Basically, you find it in traditional utilities to an extent. 
but these sectors are heavily regulated. So whether we should change the symmetric regulation for asymmetric is maybe a question, but it's, it's difficult to make a real analogy. Killer acquisitions is a, is a real issue. I am still trying to understand the court ruling in Illumina Grail. Well, I do understand is the court basically says, you, you, you're right, you have an investment gap, but you cannot fix it by reverting to the interpretation that was given back in 1989. And it's true that this is what the legislators wanted, et cetera. All this, the court said is right. But you're 35 years later, the world is completely different. If you want to do this, you need to be re-legitimized by the legislator. In principle, this is fine, except that in the case of the major regulation, the legislator needs to decide by unanimity. And you know, if you look at what, for example, Ireland think about what should be in the major regulation and what France think what should be in the major regulation, I can tell you it's extremely different. Ireland basically think it's fine as it is, and I agree. And France has all sorts of ideas about, uh, yes, you should prohibit dominant position, but for this is a French company or something like this. And uh, uh, um, so the likelihood that this conversation is productive in, in the council is, is really close to zero. So if we could manage to bring everybody to reason and uh, say, well, listen, we have a problem. We all agree we have. And we basically all agree on the solution, which I think is pretty much the case. So let's fix just this problem neatly, quickly, and everybody promises it doesn't reopen the rest. That would be the first best. Whether it is in reach, this is something I'll try to explore in the, in the, in the months to come. If not, and in any case, in the meantime, we will have to rely and member states that have alternative to turnover threshold systems to attract cases in their jurisdiction, be it uh, market share thresholds, be it transaction value, or be it call-in provisions. A last word to say that call-in provision create a specific issue in my view, that they're very good, but they're usually associated with a requirement for local nexus. Uh, so you need to have a specific hook in your jurisdiction and if you look at Illumina Grail, and Illumina Grail is pretty standard in that respect, the characteristics of these cases is that they have no local nexus. I mean, maybe Illumina Grail is not a problem, but if we're right and it is a problem, it is pretty much a problem everywhere in the world. There's no, nothing specific to Ireland, France, or anywhere. So this local nexus provision that was introduced for good reasons, this is that when you want to take a case below any threshold, it's because it matters specifically for you. That makes it a difficulty to address this type of cases. But just on the killer acquisitions uh, issue, is that a bigger problem here than in Europe, or in the US than Europe? No. No. No, it's a, if it's a problem, it's a problem everywhere. It's a difficult issue. Because, well, you have sort of reverse killer acquisition. There's a number of, it's everything that is associated with nascent uh, firms, basically. It's not only killer, killer acquisitions. But uh, killer acquisitions is a problem in pharmaceuticals mm -hmm. in, because it's basically about acquiring a firm to shut it down. Yeah. So because this innovation is threatening your cash flow. And that is what, it's not only a competition issue, I mean, in terms of productivity and competitiveness, it's, it, it's unacceptable. Loretta, mm -hmm. and it, uh, Olivier needs to leave shortly. So if anyone has a question, uh, indicate uh right just from a business perspective so what we typically hear when it comes to rebooting eu competitiveness is that there are clear priorities that more needs to be done in terms of finding the right regulatory balance in terms of unlocking capital markets in terms of um a more fertile innovation environment so interested in your views on that and if you think that with the new institutions the new boom coming in if there will be any movement or shift in in the view well i i've been launching almost 10 years ago capital market union 10 years later it's pretty much where i left it 20, 10 years ago so i'm not super optimistic um 
but it's you're right it's more necessary than ever um and but that would require that several players in that game change radically the way they approach the issue the member states first because the member states push you invariably as their first best their individual optimum so the battle in council to try to drag the center of gravity of the thing closer to what suits them individually better and uh, the price for this is invariably complexity you have a carve out here a specific provision there etc cetera, etc cetera. and the cost of this complexity is on the companies fun fact 15 years ago the whole financial industry came to see me and said Mr. Gerson, we need to have a portable pension plan that asset managers and life insurers can freely uh, commercialize in the union in competition. Great. So we worked with them. We produced the regulation to enable this. And we put it to the council. Very simple. With one single specific for this, the trans-European tax regime. Because of course, if you want it to be fluidly transported, you need not to have a tax advisor in each of the 27 member states. After 18 months of discussion, it came back with 27 compartments, 27 regulations, and 27 tax regimes. The result is that the management fees and cost outweighed by a large distance any rate of return. Therefore, no product was ever put on the market. It's not always that bad, but it's, it's, I think it's a good example. Okay, many thanks uh, for your time. Thank you. It was fascinating. Thank you.